Well, happy Mother's Day, everybody. And we love you guys. And we know that today is a, can be a day full of joy. I see some little babies around the room this morning. I know that today can be a difficult day. Um, so wherever you are, wherever you find yourself in, in, uh, in the journey of life, we, we love you. And God loves you and God's with you on the highways and on the lowways. God's with you in the valleys and in the peaks. He's there all the time. And all the time, God is good. So we love you guys so much. Thank you for joining us this Mother's Day. If you have your Bibles with you, let's go ahead and grab those. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 18 for our time this morning. But before we dive in, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for um, this opportunity for us to come together and point our eyes and our hearts to you, to open up your word and and ask you to show us uh, how you would have us live, to show us how you've created us and who you've created us to be. Father, we pray for the mothers in the room. We pray for um, the daughters in the room. We pray for uh, the aunts in the room. We pray for the families and the friends and the teachers and the coaches and everyone who's made such an impact on our lives. Each and every one of us, Lord, have been impacted by uh, the, the, the amazing women you've put in our lives. And so, Lord, we lift them all up to you today. And, Lord, we uh, ask that you just hold them in your arms and uh, you help them to, to know that, that you love them so much, that, that they are yours, that they are your daughters. And so, Father, uh, I just pray you stir our affections for you this morning as we open up your word and, and we see how you would have us live in light of who you've called us to be. Uh, Father, we pray for uh, just the, the world we live in. We pray for those around us. We ask, Lord, that you just hold us close and encourage our hearts and give us that peace and that comfort to know that you are good and in control and, and, and uh, are, are, are always lighting our path ahead of us. So, Lord, help us to follow. So, Lord, uh, speak to us through your word today as we open it up and see how Jesus tells us to live. It's in Jesus' strong, holy, mighty, glorious, amazing name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, if you guys have been with us the past few weeks, uh, we've been in a series called Jesus Said What? And so we're looking at some of the really interesting things that Jesus has said, looking at some of these uh, really kind of bold and audacious and radical things that Jesus has said and, and, and seeing that th- those things that Jesus often says to catch our attention are meant to draw us in closer. He has a deeper meaning about life. And he wants to compare and contrast the way that we see the world versus the way that he sees the world. And probably nowhere do we see that demonstrated more clearly than in what we're going to look at today when Jesus redefines what it means to be great. He he challenges our definition of greatness and how we actually see the world around us. But before we read Jesus' definition, I just want to ask you, how would you define greatness? What what are the characteristics that make up greatness that would lead someone to be great? Great. You know, it's interesting, I I think, I don't know about you guys, but I I know in kind of my friend circles, we often love to talk about who is the greatest. Who's the goat, right? Who's the greatest of all time? You know, and and there's all these things around us in in society and culture, like the Grammys and the Oscars and the Emmys and all these things. We're always comparing and contrasting who is the greatest. Is it it Tom Brady or is it Joe Montana, right? Is it MJ or is it LeBron? Is it Leo or is it George Clooney? Is it KC Barbecue, Texas Barbecue, or Memphis Barbecue? No, KC, obviously. <laughs> Clear answer. This guy. Clear answer. But we love to talk about what is the greatest. A few years ago, you probably saw the, uh, cut all the memes that started coming out and uh, all of the, uh, the, the, the talk about who's on your Mount Rushmore. You guys remember this? Hey, who, who's on your Mount Rushmore? Who's on your Mount Rushmore of, of actors or of music or of 80s music? You've got to have MJ on there, right? And Prince, if Prince isn't on there, it's not truly a Mount Rushmore. Or who is on your Mount Rushmore of your favorite athletes, right? I mean, if you don't have Babe Ruth, MJ, Wayne Gretzky, and I mean, we can take a leave that guy. It's, you know, it, 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 that's a Mount Rushmore. And it's fun to talk about who is the greatest. I think we love great things. We love beautiful mountains, and we love delicious meals. We love to go to Red Rocks and listen to the greatest bands. That's why we love autographs and signed books. But there's something deeper about greatness that draws us in. It's not just our desire to be near greatness or to be around greatness. I think there's a deep down desire for us to experience greatness. And we want to experience that in our own lives as well. Malcolm Gladwell, he's an author, he wrote a book called Outliners. Some of you probably read it. He talks about in his book Outliners how to be great, how to become an expert. And he says this, he says that if you want to become an expert in whatever your field is, you need to put in 10,000 hours worth of practice, 10,000 hours. So if you want to be a great violinist, 
10,000 hours. If you want to be a great author, 10,000 hours. If you want to be a great parent, let's think about that. Eight hours a day, was that 1,250 days, uh, 365 days a year. So by the time your kids are three and a half, you should be great parents, right? How are we doing there? We, we, we nailing it? Moms, we got this today? But I think there's that desire, right, inside of us that we want to be great. But think about how our culture defines greatness. Our culture defines greatness by what? Accomplishment and production. And so we, we value our, our greatness based on what we do, how we perform, how much we can actually accomplish. And this is what is so radical about what Jesus says, because Jesus' definition of greatness is the exact opposite. Notice what Jesus says. Look with me if you are in Matthew chapter 18, uh, verses 1 through 5. This is what Jesus says. It's, it's radical. At this time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them. And he says this, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Forefront, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Jesus gives us this definition of greatness that is countercultural, that is so different than the world around us, that is opposite of what we see around us. And, and I love the disciples. I, I, I love the disciples because they, they show us ourselves, don't they? The disciples remind me of me all the time because here they are walking with Jesus, and yet they miss so much of what he says, just like I do. They, they miss so much. You know, the, the disciples are, 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 are just kind of in this, in this debate. They're arguing about who is the greatest. Mark, in, Mark 9 gives us an account of this. He says they're actually arguing about this. And, and Luke 9, Luke says that, that, God, that Jesus discerns their thoughts. And so we see there's this discussion that they're talking about who is going to be the greatest one around them. And this should jump out at us what Jesus says. Because what Jesus says is opposite of the way that we view greatness in our life. Because for us, how do we discern greatness? Like for you, specifically in your life, when you compare yourself to somebody else, how do you know if you're great? So I think that there's a, there, there seems to be this competition that goes on in culture. And there's the comparison game. Where the only way we can truly judge our greatness is based on somebody else. And so I look at you and your life and I try to gauge myself and I grade myself based on what I see in your life. Compared to what I see in mine. That's why we care so much about what people have to say about us. Because we're measuring our greatness based on somebody else. And this is what the disciples are doing here in Matthew 18. They're having this debate in verse 1 about who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you guys are familiar with the, kind of the backstory to uh, the disciples, the disciples were following Jesus, and they knew there was something special about this guy. And they were following him because they, they thought he was truly the divine son of God, but their expectation was that Jesus was going to be king. He was going to be the king of Israel. And, and so Jesus was going to be the one that's going to move into a prominent place and take the throne. And now, as part of their, his crew, these guys were going to have high, lofty positions in the kingdom. They were going to have cabinet posts. And so these guys aren't arguing about who's going to have the most Instagram followers, who's going to be on the most magazine covers. They're arguing about who's going to be vice president and secretary of state, secretary of homeland defense. So Jesus knows that. And he draws this in, them into this discussion about greatness, and he challenges their definition. Now, probably what a lot of commentators think is going on here is, is this the discussion about greatness starts actually back in Matthew 17. Because in Matthew 17, we see Jesus kind of picks out a couple of disciples, and he goes up on the mountain, and, and we see in Matthew 17 that Jesus is transfigured in front of them. And so Jesus, his clothes turn white, and there's this white, this bright light from heaven that comes down, and then uh, Peter, James, and John hear God's voice, and they see Moses right there, and, and Elijah, and, 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 you know, they're, and they're, their minds are blown. And so I'm sure they went down the mountain and told the other guys, and the other guys are probably wondering, well, why did Peter, James, and John get to go? Like, why didn't we get to go? Then a little later in Matthew 17, we see that one of the tax collectors comes up to Peter and says, Peter, how come Jesus doesn't pay the temple tax? And, and so outsiders are starting to realize, well, I don't want to go talk to Jesus about this. Let me go talk to Peter. And so I think that the disciples are seeing that Peter's kind of elevated up, like Peter's starting to be the leader, and they don't like it. And so they start this kind of argument. Well, who's going to be the greatest? And what really happens is they start competing with each other. 
They're arguing about who's going to be first and who's going to be second and who's going to be third. So what Jesus does here in, in this idea uh, about greatness is, is he, he says, look, we've got to stop the competition. See, the, the, the question that they ask Jesus, who, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, it's not a bad question. It's not wrong to say, Jesus, what does it mean to be great in your kingdom? But their motivation was wrong. They had the wrong motivation. They wanted to be great for the wrong reasons. And then Jesus speaks into their life and says, you have to stop the competition. Think about your life. Think about the relationships you have maybe at work or in your friend groups, right? The circles of influence that you're in. Think about the competition that goes on to prove who's greater. Let me ask you a question. Show of hands. How many of you at work or at school have had a situation where somebody undermined you to get their name recognized? Anybody? Pretty much everybody, right? I mean, everybody's had that experience. Or, or, or you're working on a project and somebody on the project puts their name first. They want to be the one that gets recognized for that. In our culture, we have this concept of you have to get what you want, right? And so you have to, to make what you want happen on your own. And, and what ends up happening is people end up climbing over people. So, so our culture says do what you have to do to get where you want to go. And so people undermine each other, people compete with each other, people climb over each other, and it creates like this kind of really negative environment and negative atmosphere where we're always competing with each other. It's like the Kentucky Derby. You're just jockeying for positions back and forth, and this is what the disciples are doing right now. And I think all around us in culture, all around us in life is this competition. We, we see this, this competitive nature in, in everywhere we, we look. And, and what we do is we are, are trying to look the part. We're trying to prove we belong. Or we're trying to prove we value, that we're valuable, that we, that we matter. See, I, I think what, what, what at the root of this is, is our desire isn't just greatness. There's nothing wrong with a desire for greatness. The problem is our desire is greaterness, that we want to be greater than somebody else. It's not just, Jesus, I want to be great. It's that I want to be better than this guy. I want to be greater than, than, than that person. Because if I'm better than you, then I feel good about myself. I've shared with you guys, I, I spent almost 13 years working in HR. And um, just in the HR world, you see this over and over again, that people are trying to leapfrog each other. Over and over again, the uh, second in charge is trying to turn in the first person in charge so they can make a name for themselves. So that when that position comes available, they can be the one that gets it. There's this jockeying that's always going on. And Jesus is telling us, look, we have to stop that because that sort of attitude will never lead to greatness. What it does instead is it drives us into the comparison game. And that leads us to pride. C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, has an amazing quote on pride. Notice what he says. He says here, he said, Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. We, we say we, that people are proud of being richer or cleverer or better looking than others. If everyone else became equally rich or clever or good looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. It is the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. See, this is what pride does. It leads us in this comparison game. And I start to compare myself versus you. It, it, it's toxic. See, pride is a killer. And pride takes us down a path we don't want to go. Pride caused Adam and Eve to fall out of the garden. Pride caused Saul to lose the kingdom. Pride ends relationships. It breaks up marriages. It ends careers. Why? Because I'm always trying to figure out what I can get. And I'm always comparing myself to you. And that's exhausting. Because if I'm in the lead and I'm seeing some success, I'm trying to keep my lead. But if I'm not in the lead... I'm discouraged, and I feel like I don't matter, and I beat myself up. See, pride is ugly, and pride is dangerous, because pride is a competition for social status. And pride can even happen spiritually to us. This isn't something that just happens at work. This isn't something that just happens in, in your friend groups. This is something that can happen to all of us. And you start to get your value based on that. And so you look around at, at, at your friends at church and the people that you're in life groups with, and you start to say, well, man, I'm, man that person is just so much holier than I am. That person is just doing so much better than I am with my faith. And I start to get really down on myself. Or, or maybe I'm in a season of life that's not very good, and something happens to you that I want to happen to me, and I get jealous, and I get envious, and it takes me down a place that I don't want to go. You know, so pride can make you feel good because you look around and you see, hey, I'm doing really great. I'm feeling really successful. I matter. I value. But what happens when you're, you're in a, you feel like you're in a good moment 
and you feel like your family's in a good place, and, and all these things are going on, but then you get on Instagram, and you see that friend of yours, and their family's at the beach, and they're all matchy-matchy in that nice shade of blue, and they're all smiling at the same time. And all of a sudden, what happens? That switch goes off inside of you, and you're going, how come I never get to go to the beach? I haven't been on a vacation in years, and I can never find shirts that match, and how come my kids never smile at the same time? Like, I need to Photoshop this thing, right? What happens? You start to feel bad about yourself. You start to feel like you're not as great as they are. Like, yeah, this person's great. I'm just not as good. And it beats us up, and we carry it around, and we wear it. And so Jesus is telling us, look, we got to stop the comparison game, and we got to stop the competition because it gets us nowhere. And actually, it causes us to miss out on what God's doing. You know, what Jesus says, he reminds me of Paul's words in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Notice what he says. Paul says this. He says, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they're not wise. What's Paul saying? He's saying that there's no wisdom in comparison. Because God has each of us on a different, uh, a different path. God has his plan for your life. is going to look a little differently than his plan for my life. And so I can't actually get an accurate view of you, of myself, if I look through you. I have to see who I am in light of Jesus. That's the only way I can truly see myself and who I truly am. And so the comparison game leads to folly. There's no wisdom in it. And this is what's going on with the disciples. And so Jesus kind of slaps them around a little bit and says, look, we need to redefine success. Notice what he says in verse 2. He says this, And calling to him a child, he put in the, him in the midst of them and says, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus, it, this, is, this is shocking. Jesus is walking around and he calls a, a child. He says, hey, come over here. And he sits him down in the middle and he uses that child as the comparison. He says, you guys want to compare each other? Compare yourself to this child. And he says, what you need to do is you need to stop comparing. And you need to change your course. You need to change the way you see the world. And look at the world like this little one looks at the world. In verse 2, there's a word that really stands out. It's turn. Jesus says, it's a turn. Some of your Bibles may say uh, convert. But the word turn, it's really similar to the word Repent which means to turn back. And so Jesus is saying, look, the world works a certain way. You need to turn from that way. You need to turn from that dog-eat-dog mentality. You need to turn from this comparison game and turn and follow me into freedom and turn and follow me into the place you're actually going to find value in in who you are and who God has created you to be. Now, the hard part about this is that we want Jesus to turn us, don't we? Like Jesus just... Show me where I need to go. And Jesus is like, okay, I'm going to show you where you need to go. Here's where you need to go. And we're like, okay, Jesus, I actually need you to turn me. The turning is the hard part. Jesus prompts us. Jesus shows us. But we have to actually turn on our own. And see, I think that's where a lot of us fall short. And that's where a lot of us miss it. But Jesus gives us this comparison to this child to cause us to, to say, what? Because in, in that culture just like ours in many ways. In that culture, children had zero significance. And in and, and a Hebrew culture, and especially in first century Israel, he, the, the, these children had zero sig- significance. And, and, I, and I know even in our so- t- culture, I know we elevate children more than, than they did, but I mean, really, when was the last time a kid made your goat list, right? When was the last time a kid made your greatest of all time or your Mount Rushmore? I mean, maybe Mike Jackson, right? A young Mike Jackson, but that's about it. Like we don't usually involve our little ones in big decisions. It'd be like if you went home and asked your three-year-old, hey, we're thinking about trying to decide, do we pay off the car or do we put money in our kid in your saving account? What do you think we should do? And the three-year-old says, give me cookies. <laughs> you know, there's actually some brilliance in that, right? Because I think a good cookie does help you make a, a good decision. But I, we're not going to involve our little ones in the major decisions of life. So what Jesus is trying to draw us into is something that's radical and that countercultural and something that we aren't really going to understand. Because Jesus is showing us something about kids. He's saying kids view the world differently than we do. Because what happens is we grow up, we get a little jaded, we grow up, we get a little, uh, we, we get, we get a little um, uh, kind of feeling that, that, that we don't belong. Pride starts to get inside of us and we start to look at situations through this kind of pre-programmed competitive nature. And Jesus says, you got to stop that. you got to get back and turn back to looking at the world like you did when you were a kid. Because that is where true greatness is found. So Jesus says, you have to flip the script. 
You have to stop living by the plan of the world, and you actually have to live by the plan of your heavenly Father. And that is for you to have a childlike faith and to trust him like a little one does. See, some of us in this room right now have been Christians for a long time. Some of you guys have been Christians for years, decades. Some of you recently became Christians. Maybe there's somebody here today, somebody tuning online that has yet to put their faith in Jesus. And so it's easy for us to look and say, oh, he's not talking to me. He's not talking to me. I don't need to turn. I've been following Jesus a long time. And actually, Jesus, since I've been following you a long time, I think you actually kind of owing me. I think you kind of owe me some things now. I've been super faithful, Jesus. And this is what Jesus is saying. No, we turn to God when we put our faith in Jesus the very first time, and we turn to Jesus every single day after. Because we can so easily be lulled asleep by pride and find ourselves on a path we don't want to go. And we look back and we see we veer so far off the path. So Jesus is speaking to every single one of us today. Whether you've been a Christian for 80 years or 8 days, maybe you haven't put your faith in Jesus yet, but he's calling you to today. And today is the day. Jesus said we need to turn to him and follow his way because his way is actually the only path to greatness. And it's the only way that's going to fill our heart and our soul with what we desire so much. And that is Jesus himself. So Jesus says you need to turn The question is, what do we turn to? I love what he says in verse 4. Look at verse 4. He says this. He says, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. See, Jesus uses the child as the picture of humility. If we're going to compare ourselves, compare yourself to this child. He is the picture of humility. Now, I I think sometimes we hear that and we go, okay, Jesus, what, what do you really mean here? I mean, are we supposed to be, just be like a bunch of kids running around in our, in our diapers, picking our nose, you know, just running around like a bunch, of, a bunch of little ones? And that's not what he's saying. He's not talking about immaturity. There's a difference between childishness and childlikeness. You know, when my, my second daughter, Hallie, she's seven, when she was about three, she would come up to you and she would ask you for something. And if you d- said no and you didn't give her what she wanted, she'd stomp off and march off and say and look back over her shoulder, I'm never coming back here again. <laughs> it's like, well... Okay, I'll see you in three minutes, you know, that kind of thing. Childishness would be, God, I'm not getting what I want out of my life. God, I'm not great yet according to the standards I feel. God, you're not blessing me. See, Jesus didn't tell us to be childish, but he is saying being childlike. That we need to have the characteristics that we see in children of humility. Because think about kids. Think about the kids in our life. Kids don't have resumes, Kids aren't trying to come and build up a list of accomplishments. I mean, yeah, kids get a little older in the teenage years, they start the comparison game, but when your kids are little, they're not comparing each other. They're not thinking that I'm you know, better or worse than another kid. They're just being kids. And kids trust their parents. And kids trust where their parents are taking them. And so Jesus said, we need to, 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 to be more like kids. See, your kids don't come up to you and say, hey, mom, I've limited my screen time by 32%, just like you asked, and I've brushed my teeth, and I, and, I, and I fed and watered the cat. Can I have what I want? Jesus, we don't see that in kids. No, kids, they, they come and they have, they have, maybe they have expectations, but kids are going to listen. They might not like it, but they're going to listen, and they're going to follow, and they're going to love you just the same whether you said yes or whether you, you said no. And so Jesus is saying, look, we need to be more like these little ones. And there's something beautiful about the heart of children that Jesus is trying to draw us into. He's saying they're not competitive. They're not trying to climb the ladder to social status like we are. They're not comparing each other. Rather, what are they doing? They're trusting their parents. And so Jesus says, you need to trust your heavenly father, just like this little one trusts his mom and his dad. So Jesus says this, the humility is what equals greatness. Not rank, not order, not followers, not position. Humility is what equals greatness. The uh, the quote by Tim Keller I actually love, he he says this. He says that, that, that the essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself. It's thinking of myself less. And see, this is what Jesus is trying to tell us is, look, stop the competition. Stop comparing yourself. Stop trying to build your resume. Stop trying to come with your list of accomplishments because the kingdom of heaven is not filled with VIPs. The kingdom of heaven is not filled with people who have reached certain milestones. You know what the kingdom of heaven is filled with? God's children, God's sons, and God's daughters. And so Jesus, Jesus is telling us we need to start seeing ourselves, who we are in light of who Jesus says 
that we are. So let me ask you, when you look at yourself in the mirror, what do you see? When you spend a moment looking at who you are and thinking about who you are and your failures and your accomplishments, what do you see? Do you see yourself as this person who's just ah, not adding up, who just can't seem to get there, who's always falling short? Or do you see yourself as the son and the daughter of God, as the person who has been redeemed and rescued and saved and set free and no longer having to compete with the world? Because there's freedom in that, whereas the other one feels like slavery and bondage. So Jesus says, you got to free yourself from this mess And start seeing yourself as he sees us. It reminds me of what Paul says in Ephesians 5. He says this. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Paul says, look, you imitate God. Imitate what you see in Jesus because Jesus shows you the way. Jesus shows you what humility looks like. It's what we see in Philippians 2. I mean, Jesus is the most humble person that ever has lived in in the entire history of the world, stepped out of heaven and came down here for us and showed us what humility truly looks like. Notice what Paul says in Philippians 2. He says this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He what? humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus is saying, see yourself in light of how I see you because I see you as the son and daughter of God that is so valuable and so worth it that I stepped out of heaven and came down here and traded places with you on the cross. And he says, when we get a self-awareness of this, of who we are in Jesus, it can change everything. It can pull us out of the trap and can put us on the path to who Jesus wants us to be. But if we are going to grow up into those people God wants us to be, then it means I have to have less of myself. Less of myself means more humility, and more humility means more Jesus. Amen? Less is more. Jesus is the first is last, and the last is first. It doesn't make sense to the world, but Jesus says this is the currency of the kingdom. So Jesus says if you want to be great, you have to become like a child But what does that actually look like in my life? Notice verse 5. I love what he says. Verse 5, he says this. He says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. So be like a child, but whoever receives a child, like I receive a child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I I like how Mark says it, or Jesus says it in Mark 9. He says this. He says, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. See, if you want to be first, Jesus says you have to put yourself last. Greatness doesn't come from moving up the ladder. Greatness comes from moving down the ladder, from not seeking social status, but rather seeing yourself as God sees you and letting that change the way you live. The path is not up. The path is down. So I think what Jesus is getting at, and he wants each of us to see here, is that the significance of our life, the, 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 the ability to impact the impact of our life is going to come down to the very end of our lives. Are we going to look back in our life and we're going to say that my life was meant on trying to be served by somebody else because I wanted to be great or whether I served somebody else because Jesus is great. So when you look at your life today, how will you answer that question? Are you receiving others like Jesus received you? Are you serving others like Jesus has served you? Because this is the picture that Jesus wants us to see, that Jesus came out of of heaven, of glory, of the most amazing reality we could ever imagine and came here and went through the mess that we go through and experiences the heartaches that we experience and went through every single pain that you and I could go through and traded places with us so we have hope and we can follow the life that he has created us to live. And Jesus says that we will never feel like we've made it as long as we're trying to put ourselves first. But something amazing happens when you put yourself last. Something wells up inside of you and changes you from the inside out. Because when you make yourself a servant of all, it's then that Jesus 
brings greatness into your life. I want to close with this. Some of you guys might be familiar with the, um, the he was a priest and a theologian and, and author, Henry Now Nowen. And uh, just a brilliant, a brilliant guy. And, and he talked a lot about how we find value and purpose in our life. And Henry Nowen said this. He says, what happens is we typically fall for one of three lies. And maybe some of us, we fall for all three. But we believe that we will find value in our lives based on what I have or what I do or based on what people have to say about me. And so as you read that list, do you find yourself there? I know I do. We try to find our value based on these things. We think, if, if I have enough of this, then I'll feel like I matter. I'll feel like I belong. I feel, I'll feel like I have value. But I want you to notice what, what no one says. He says that as long as we continue to live as we are, what we do or what we have or what other people think about us, we will remain filled with judgments, opinions, evaluations, and condemnations. Will we remain addicted to putting people and things in the right place. Any of you guys feel that right now in your life, that you feel this, you're just like living for the opinion, you're living for the evaluation, or maybe you're just under the weight of a condemnation because you're living for what people are saying or you're gauging yourself by what you have or you're finding your value in what you do. See, Jesus says the way up is down. The way to find value and purpose is by seeing yourself as the beloved son and daughter of God. And that is what changes everything. See, God is calling us to him. And Jesus is calling us to take our eyes off of us and to put our eyes on him because when we do, everything changes. So now when it concludes by saying, the further I run away from the place where God dwells, the less I am able to hear the voice that calls me the beloved and the less I hear the voice, the more entangled I become in the manipulations and the power games of the world. So some of us today, we just need to come back. We need to turn. Wherever we are right now, wherever we find ourselves, we need to turn and to follow Jesus. And that might mean that I need to, to drop to my knees today and say, Jesus, I am sorry for getting on the wrong path. Jesus, I am sorry for being led away. I'm sorry for getting pulled in the comparison trap and pride making me compete for my place. And to realize, Jesus... You gave your life for me. That's enough for me. Maybe somebody here today that has never made the decision to follow Jesus and you were exhausted and you were worn out and you are just sick trying to keep up with the Joneses. And Jesus says you can lay it all down today and be freed from all of that by simply putting your faith in me. So for, for whatever it is, wherever you are this morning, whatever it is that's weighing you down, Jesus is just saying, come to me and I'll give you rest. Come to me, and I'll give you everything you need. Jesus says, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Forefront, my prayer is that we turn our eyes to God, and like his sons and his daughters, we follow him every step of the way. So let's join and do this together. Would you pray with me?